Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Thank you so much for welcoming me into your space. I, inshallah, you had an incredible day of uh, refueling your soul uh, and trying to push for social justice uh, causes that are important to you all. Um, I know that many of you heard parts and bits and pieces of my story. You know I'm the eldest of 14, mashallah, and I'm also a person that you know, was my mother's translator until I was 12 years old. Uh, my mother only had eighth grade, eighth grade education, my father fourth grade education. Um, but part of the American story that never gets told is that Sister Ilhan Omar and myself got elected by fellow Americans that didn't share our faith nor our ethnic, ethnic background. And that's the part of the story that never gets told, ever. And, and, and it's really, uh, you know, I'm always taken aback by that because people assume that's what, how we got elected. And I'm telling you, the majority of my district is African American, the majority of her district is white. And we still got elected and made history. And if that is not a moment of light in the time of darkness, I don't know what can be. Um, so when I won uh, United States Congress, this over a year ago today, uh, this month, uh, you probably saw my mom Zagret. Uh, you probably saw that. It made everybody cry. It made me cry. I was like, oh my God, mama. Uh, on your wedding day and then when you come a Congress member. Um, I remember seeing this video my, my sister Layla sent me about my Siti Muftiya in, the, in Beit Ur al Fulka. My dad's from Beit Hanina, for all those that always will ask me later. My mother is from Beit Ur al Fulka, not the Tehta. And Beit Ur al Fulka is a very small village, about 700 people now. And uh, it, it is very small compared to other villages. And my city, uh, Muftiya, of course, comes out and all this media is there. And she realized, you know, I had won. And I remember my sister sent me the link of the story and I click it and the first thing I see is these beautiful hands of hers. You know, there's something about Palestinian city hands. Do you know what I mean? Because they're out in the sun, and all that stuff. They're out there all the time. You know what I'm talking about. And if you're Palestinian, you know what I mean. So as soon as I saw the hands, I, of course, I teared up. But the best part of that interview was, they said, well, what do you think now, Rashida won, you know, your granddaughter, what do you think, and everything. She goes, halas, halat Palestine. I said, oh, Siti, that's not how it works. Like, Palestine will not be free just because I got elected to the United States Congress. It is a lot more work uh, than, than that. Um, what I love too is my, my yamma, my, my yamma is the most compassionate person you ever meet in my city. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, they do not know Twitter. Alhamdulillah. Like no joke, I cannot have them on Twitter. It's, it's bad enough that my cousin Hayat and family members got my mom on Facebook. But I keep a lot of things away from my, my family and it's harder, it's getting harder now. You know, civil disobedience, social justice works. And some of my young women in this room know what I'm talking about. We don't tell our parents everything when we do social justice work because you're more worried about us, you know, getting arrested and making too much noise, all this. And what I love is uh, when, when, of course, at the moment of really painful time for me, I was, you know, many people were watching what am I going to do and everything, getting denied entry into uh, going to see my city and, and also trying to uplift the crisis, I believe, the human rights crisis that we see now in Palestine. And uh, I, I remember this, this woman is telling my city, you know, did you see what the president of the United States said about your granddaughter? And city's like, she, well, she don't know Twitter. She's like, what are you talking about? And, you know, she's never gone to school. She's completely illiterate. Like, she doesn't even read Arabic. And so the woman proceeds to translate to her the, the tweet that he sent out, which is an awful tweet, you know, pretty much kind of making fun of the fact that I got denied entry and even put my put grandmother in, in quotes. I, I can't, people want me to read his mind. I don't know what he's thinking. So my, my city, as, as the woman is translating to her this, this tweet that she has no idea what that is, and all of a sudden, you could see my city's face completely change. I mean, this is a woman that doesn't really get angry. She's very calm. And she's just like, Allah hidda. And I was like, oh, my God. Because I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't see the interview. All I know is this Washington Post was Congresswoman Tlaib's grandmother says God ruined him on President Trump. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool. And me and my brothers and sisters were like, 
man, I wonder what Siti really said. I bet you, did they translate it right? And I was like, she probably said that. I don't know. We'll see. And so sure enough, just watching her face change, it was incredible. And I remember another person interviewing Siti and asking her, well, would you ever invite President Trump to, to your home? She says, yes, if he supports the peace plan or something. She, they said, if, if he supports the peace plan, would you let him come to your home? She's like, yes, but he can't come as president. He comes as himself. Typical Palestinian city right there. No, 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 but the Egypt, he has to come himself. He can't come with his title. He can't come, he has to come like a regular person. And uh, that's who my grandmother is and that's who I'm very much inspired and rooted from. And I always tell people and remind you all that I grew up in the most beautiful blackest uh, city in the, in the world, in the country, I mean, and see, I'm tired. Um, and one of the things I love about uh, you know, the black mothers in my neighborhood on down the block is when my mother used to be somewhere in her, you know, she had an accent, so she kind of whispered because you know, she's a little bit a little scared kind of speaking up. Uh, it was the, the black mothers on the block that would say, speak up, speak up, powerful, just speak up. Just in, completely empowering. It, it was unbelievable to watch. And so I've been telling the story today about, you know, translating for my mom until I was 12 years old. And I remember, you know, at that moment at 12, being at Sears at a cashier counter, and I'm translating what my mom wants to say to the cashier. She's bringing stuff up. Children, if you're a child of immigrants, you know what I'm talking about. Brings the thing up. I'm, I'm translating what my yama is saying to the cashier. And the cashier started getting frustrated. So she starts saying something like, you know, she should learn English. What is wrong with her? Like, you know, she should just learn it. And I, of course, mama bear in me, I'm very protective. It just comes out. Rrr. I was like, excuse me. And at 12 years old, bopping my head, I was like, excuse me. I just want to point this out to you that I am not translating what you're saying to my mother. I'm only translating what my mother is saying to you. She understands what you're saying. But people like you are the reason that she won't speak English because you keep making fun or you raise your voice and you still, you still are hateful. You still are not compassionate. You don't get it. And so as we walk out, my mother's like, This is the last time we go to this Sears. So I want to leave you with this, you know, many people that have been closest to me about my activism work in Detroit and throughout Wayne County communities and neighborhoods that I represent is that, you know, I wanted to get there because I wanted people to feel heard and seen. I wanted my neighbors, the community that raised me, that empowered my mother to speak up, to understand that corporate greed will not win that they will be elevated out of poverty. And I represent the third poorest congressional district in the country. I wanted to show them that. And I wanted to see that the strength of me being a Palestinian American, a woman that is a child of immigrants, the eldest of 14, that I wasn't gonna back down, I wasn't gonna sell out because I have seen the pain of, of, in my parents' eyes every time they felt like they were getting sold out. Not only by people on the issue of Palestine, but even even our own government, our own country here, selling them out and trying to silence them because they want their ancestors, they want their parents to die with human dignity in Palestine. But it is important that you all know, as I'm there for 11 months, the one thing I want you all to know as you leave here, again, empowered to push forward on social justice issues and human rights issues for Palestine especially, for Palestine. It's our beloved Philistine. And I know we're pushing a lot of things and empowering Muslim Americans across this country. The one thing that I feel like is when we're talking about issues around what's happening at the border, what's happening even to our black brothers and sisters across this country, police brutality, all of it, all of it is so connected with the same movement. It's because when I went to the border to El Paso, wahiyat Allah, I don't know why, as soon as that four-year-old boy came up to the, the, wind, the door, the glass door, and he asked me in Spanish where his father was, I thought of Gaza. Every time I see some sort of economic oppression on my black brothers and sisters, the kind of othering and dehumanization of my immigrant neighbors, it reminds me of what my family continues to go through in Palestine. 
African-American pastor said to me that this country, our country, is not divided. It's not divided. It is just disconnected. We have to connect our movements with each other, uh, others' movements. So please speak up. <laughs> speak up and don't wait until it's us. Because when the Muslim sister at a Flint Mejdid told me, this is years ago, she said, Rashida, why isn't anybody speaking up? There is a candidate out there, and he did win, pushing for the Muslim ban. And I said to her, but sis, what did you say when he said Mexicans are rapists? We said nothing. Maybe there's a handful in here, but mostly our community was silent. We got to stop being so silent. I love, I love that when you go to Ramallah, there's an incredible statue of Nelson Mandela. I love that, that this man who fought against apartheid was uplifted by Palestinians because he fought for them. I want us to have us in this room. I want people to think, man, a Muslim American stood up for me. I want them to think about that, that so much of who we are in our faith drives us to speak up. Because Muhammad, peace be upon him, if he's among us today, he would have been at the border in a minute. He would have been speaking up against the economic oppression. He would be doing all of the things that I think we all have been lacking in so many ways. Speak up. Don't be silent. But there are times that you can enjoy and congratulate yourself in that. I feel like Muslims now are getting louder and much more empowering and inspiring. When an eight-year-old girl in Sacramento, California came up to me, an eight-year-old, beautiful Palestinian American child comes up to me and she's, she's hanging on to this blazer she has on over a regular shirt, just kind of a shirt that has like words on it. She's just kind of pushing the blazer down. And I said, okay, she wants me to recognize the blazer. So I said, Rian, mashallah, Anik, look at that blazer. You look so good. Look at you. And she said, I'm trying to look like you. And I said, Habibti. I was like, you're so, I was like, well, forget Congress. Run for president of the United States. The best part of the story, you know, and I'm trying to empower, inspire. The best part of it is when she goes, uh-huh. And when he thought, at that moment, I, 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 teary, I got teary-eyed because I was like, oh, my God, we did that. Like, my election, even though I was fighting for that, it inspired this girl to like, yeah, I can run for president. And I'm like, that's incredible. So when Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman to ever get elected, she said, you know, if there's not a seat at the table, bring a chair with you. I'm going to change that a little bit, just a little bit. I'm like, yeah. If there's not a seat at the table, I want you to bump somebody else off that table. No, I'm being serious. Bump somebody else off that table that's been a sellout, that has supposedly said they, they support all Americans, but won't support an, uh, the banning the Muslim ban, right? Or stopping uh, the, 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 the kind of oppression that you see happening to our black and brown brothers. That they are sitting there saying, we're going to have to push back against you know, corporations and, and, and tainting our democracy, but then they go take corporate PAC money. All I got to tell you is I want more of us running for office. And not only that, when somebody comes along and is speaking truth to power, is saying everything that we were always dreaming of, don't hesitate. Today, somebody goes to me, do you really think Senator Sanders is going to win? People in Washington don't like him. I was like, I like that people in Washington don't like him. Why would I want anybody that everybody likes in Washington? It's broken. So when Senator Sanders comes along, a Jew who says Palestinians deserve human rights, then you better be getting behind candidates like that with no hesitation, with no hesitation. I'm being serious. And look, this is a nonpartisan organization. This is the lawyer hat. You like that, Salim? You, this is nonpartisan. They are not endorsing a candidate. But let me tell you this. When Senator Bernie Sanders came along and he got into this race again, I love that he's in the race. It is a blessing for movement work all across this country. From, from poverty to mass incarceration to what's happening to our school system, 
the fact that my teachers are earning poverty wages and they have to have multiple jobs, every single thing that we think is wrong right now in our country, from the broken, inhumane healthcare system that my residents at home call sick care. They don't call it health care, they call it sick care. All of that. He is sitting there talking exactly like we want him to, and we're still hesitating. We're still hesitating. When I wore the thobe on the house floor to get sworn in, my mother's thobe, my immi's thobe, people are like, Rashida, too much, I was like, excuse me? You want me to back off and be Palestinian now? I ran as I am. Why would I ever change anything about me? Why? Why? Our own community sometimes, honestly, our own community sometimes, we're their biggest critic, but it's more painful when you all do it to each other. I'm being serious. Sometimes when you all say things like, I don't know if she should have said that, I don't know if she'd done that. First of all, I will never, ever be that perfect, polished politician. It's never gonna happen. I'm a falaha. It's just never gonna happen. It's never going to happen. So whatever you disagree with my style, agree with my heart. Agree with my heart. So I just want you all to know the way we win is we believe in what people think is impossible. We believe in what people think is impossible. People thought electing myself and Han Omar, many of the people, many of this incredible class was impossible. It wasn't, ya jama'a. It wasn't. Because people are incredible. They're resilient. And boy, do they, when they believe, it is like magic. And all of a sudden, you elect the first Palestinian woman. You elect the two first Muslim women. You elect all these incredible, beautiful array of people. Again, many of us, nobody was even thinking that could ever possibly win. And so I just hope you connect the movement work that we need to do to uplift, that you understand that we're never going to pass the ban on the Muslim, the, 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 the Muslim ban, uh, no Muslim ban act, if we're not doing the connectivity work, that we're not pushing and saying, this is not just about my religious freedom, discrimination and racism towards me and my faith. It's also about you as a fellow American. And as much as possible, as much as we can do that, the better off we are in all the movements. It is going to be wonderful in 2020 when we outwork the hate. And I know we will, because more of us are gonna run and bump somebody off of that table that doesn't belong there. And we're gonna be able to carry each other, all of our sisters and brothers in the movement, because we're gonna follow our hearts and our gut and say it's the right thing to do not strategic, not polling, not any of that. It is the right thing to do. And so thank you all so much for believing in the possibility of someone like myself serving the United States Congress. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.